Hi, friends. Thank you for joining us. We're so thrilled to have you all here, and we're excited to learn with Gila Fine on the tragedy of Haruta, the Madonna who became a whore, um, with a, just a real first-rate global Jewish educator. Uh, excited to be here with her, and we're excited to partner with BMHBJ today, and I'm going to pass it off to my colleague and friend, Rabbi Yaakov Chaitavsky, to introduce our speaker today. Uh, good morning, everybody. Pleasure to be here. See some of you again. Um, so today's speaker is Gila Fine. Uh, she is the editor-in-chief of Magid Books, a division of Koran Publishers in Jerusalem. She's a well-known teacher of Agadah and often explores tales of the Talmud, harnessing the information of philosophy, literary criticism, psychoanalysis, and pop culture. She teaches at Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies, where a cousin of mine also teaches, and the London School of Jewish Studies, the Amudim Seminary, the Nachshon Project, and has taught like this at many communities and conferences around the Jewish world. Um, she has been hailed by Haaretz as a young woman on her way to becoming one of the more outstanding Jewish thinkers of the next generation. And she's going to be discussing and tackling um, a very interesting and for some people perhaps troubling uh, series of stories in the Talmud about a very famous rabbi, Rabbi Chia, who um, was married to a woman who, I don't know, constantly pestered him and forced him to always look in the mirror. And we're going to see exactly what the upshot of the story is through some very interesting um, you know, corollary disciplines. And it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Gila Fine. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. So we can cover everybody's bases. Uh, it is very, very lovely to be with you all today. Let's go with today. Uh, I'm going to begin with uh, some, some technicalities without which no Zoom session is quite complete. So first of all, uh, you'll notice in the chat box that a link to the source sheet has just been shared. Uh, I will be sharing my screen, but for those of you who'd like to uh, take control of the source sheet, you can click on it and just have it open on your screen and flip backwards and forwards um, for those of you who would like. Uh, that is one. Two, um, we're about to learn some Torah together, and that perforce is an act of intimacy. Unfortunately, few things are less intimate than a Zoom room. So I'm going to ask that we try and approximate the experience of being in a Beit Midrash together. And to that end, I would like to ask those of you who can, uh, thank those of you who already have, but those of you who can, to please turn on your cameras so that I may see your lovely faces and I'm not just shouting into the void. Um, and yay, Ed, thank you, Ed, and thank you, Pam. Uh, next, this is not just an intimate endeavor, it is also a collaborative endeavor. I'm not going to be the one doing all the work. Thank you, Steve uh, and Alex. Uh, I will not be the one doing all the work. This is going to be a joint effort. So um, I will need some of you to read some sources. I will also be asking question and expect questions and expect brilliant answers from all of you. Uh, I welcome your questions to me at any point. So at any point, if you have something to say, raise your hand, uh, your physical hand if we can see you and your electronic hand if we can't. Uh, and myself or one of the moderators will call on you to unmute. You can also obviously use the chat box uh, whenever you would like. Dov. Unmute yourself though, it helps. You're still muted, Dov. I clicked. It's my mouse. Blame the mice. Uh, I can't print the document. Ah, okay, yes. Uh, so that is, I'm afraid, deliberate. My source sheets are very deliberately not for print. However, since you asked, Dov, and just for you, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my personal email address. Good. Uh, used with caution. And if you really want, you can write to me after today's class. And if you ask me nicely enough, I might be persuaded to share a printable copy with you. I will send an email on bended knee. 
and what well, Omen did. No, 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 no need for that. Just the email. And, and that goes for all of you. All right. So with that, let us begin. Now, I, uh, as, uh, I was, as I was introduced, I am, in fact, a teacher of Agada or rabbinic literature. Uh, and one particular set of texts that I particularly love to teach are the stories of the named women of the Talmud uh, for various reasons, most of which will become clear, I hope, in the course of today's class. Um, and the particular way that I like to teach them is through archetypes, through, oh yeah, I'm going to ask just because I get the notifications to like admit people immediately just because I get this sort of things popping up in my screen. Yes, that's that the plan. really distracting. Thank you, Pam. Um, the way I like looking at these characters of women's are through archetypes or stock characters uh, or stereotypes that are imposed upon women throughout history. Now, in this particular case, perhaps the most primal archetype that has always been imposed on women is not one archetype, but two. Since the beginning of time, or at least since the beginning of humankind, women have always been divided, dichotomized, forced into two basic binary opposites, the good woman and the bad woman, the saintly and the seductive, the maternal and the immoral, the pure and the promiscuous. This division, which later comes to be known as the Madonna Hall paradigm, really cuts across the board and anywhere we look, whatever the mythology, whatever the folklore, whatever the culture, we find evidence of it. And let's begin by sort of doing a survey of some of the Madonna halls we know and love, beginning with Jewish culture. And I'm gonna ask you to use the chat box here. Can anyone think of who are perhaps the most iconic Madonna hall pair of Jewish culture? Ah, we're going to talk about Tamar Linda actually at length. Uh, I'm looking, I'm looking for two women, not one woman, two women, one of whom is a classic Madonna and the other is a classic whore. So you, you're all giving me fantastic um, Lilith. Good, Linda. Who's the equivalent of Lilith? Who is the Madonna to Lilith's whore? Eve, fantastic, Eve and Lilith. So let's begin, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's begin with Jewish culture. And here we do have, in fact, Eve and Lilith. Um, Adam's helpmate and the first mother of all who live. And conversely, Adam's original disobedient demon wife who refuses to submit to him and flies off to terrorize the earth kill babies and seduce men in their sleep. Uh, moving on to Christianity. Can anyone tell me who the Madonna Hall pair of Christianity is? And again, I'm gonna ask you to put your answers in the chat box. Very good, Linda, Mary. In fact, the two Marys, Mary Magdalene and the Virgin Mary. And that is our second pair in number four. Um, the Virgin Mary, paradigmatically a Madonna, the Madonna, the Madonna who learns her name to all the other Madonnas, and there are Mary Magdalene, the prostitute, although I should say that today Christian Bible scholars dispute the fact that Mary Magdalene is a was a prostitute, but that is how Christians read her for a very long time. Um, let's talk about Greek culture. Homer, can anyone tell me, any classicists here, about the Madonna Hall pair of of the great Greek epic. Ah, Helen is interesting, Linda. I wonder if you think she's a Madonna or a whore. So the pair that I'm thinking of is uh, Penelope and Circe from the Odyssey. Penelope, the very faithful wife who waits for years and years to Odysse for Odysseus to return home to her. And then Circe, the treacherous witch who seduces Odysseus and turns his men into pigs. In fact, this division is so prevalent in the ancient world that it exceeds the realm of mythology and folklore and becomes an actual practice, an actual division or split in the household. It was not at all uncommon in the ancient world 
for men to have two wives, one for procreation and the other for sexual gratification. The famous um, classical um, orator Demosthenes says, mistresses we keep for pleasure and wives to bear us legitimate children and be our housekeepers. That's for our ancient culture. Now we might want to think, yeah, but that's a, such a primitive way of viewing women. And obviously we're way more advanced than that today. Uh, and so I would say that that is a, a, a wonderful, hopeful sentiment. And yes, in the many centuries since antiquity, the Madonna Hall paradigm has been refined. It's been sublimated. It has, however, never gone away entirely. And let us continue our review uh, from antiquity to the Middle Ages. Um, the Divine Comedy, Dante, gives us Beatrice and Semiramis. So Beatrice is the um, Virgin Mary-like figure who very gently guides Dante through heaven, whereas Semiramis is punished in the violent storms of hell. Moving further on to modernity, and here there are so many examples, but I've handpicked just a few. Uh, if we look at the 19th century novel, which is full of Madonna Hall duos, uh, one of my particular favorites is um, Emmy and Becky. Uh, Emmy, Amelia Seedley, who is a very innocent, loving creature, and then Becky Sharp, who's a conniving, manipulative woman. Uh, moving further to your side of the pond, very much an equivalent to Emmy and Becky, we have um, uh, Melly and Scarlett, Melanie Hamilton, again, very naive, very innocent, very maternal um, Melly, and the um, seductive and um, rather shrewish, rather shrewd um, Scarlett O'Hara. Uh, moving from fiction to film, one director who really uses this paradigm a lot is Alfred Hitchcock and nowhere, nowhere more obviously than in his movie Vertigo where he has two Madonna, very classic Madonna Hall characters, Madeline and Judy played by the same actress just to sort of drive home the point. Madeline is a, um, a sort of highborn respectable wife and Judy is a lowbrow loose woman. Um, I can also tell you that when I teach this class in England and I say, who are the Madonna Halls you can think of? Immediately everybody comes out with Elizabeth and Margaret, Diana and Fergie, Kate and Meghan. So it seems that the Madonna Hall pair is very much alive and well in the British royal family. And here you have Elizabeth and Margaret, the one being extremely presentable and the other one being quite scandalous. And then finally, who is probably the most iconic uh, Madonna Hall pair of the 20th century, and again, more from your part of the world, Jackie Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe. Uh, this is actually a poster from the show Mad Men, where they come up for a campaign for female lingerie, and the slogan is, you're a Marilyn or a Jackie, every single woman is one of them. So since antiquity and Demosthenes' famous proclamation that mistresses we keep about this hard and fast distinction between wives and mistresses, it seems that very little has changed and women can either be one or the other. So thus far, Western culture. What about rabbinic culture? What about Jewish culture? And here things become really interesting. On the one hand, the actual keeping of two women for procreation and sexual gratification is strongly condemned, it's not entirely forbidden because in rabbinic Judaism, uh, bigamy only really becomes outlawed in the Middle Ages, but it is strongly condemned by the rabbis as the height of immorality and injustice. In fact, when the rabbis seek to identify the sin of the generation of the flood, it is this sin that they point to. And at this point, I'd like to ask for a reader, please. Can somebody volunteer to read for us? There's gonna be a lot of text you will all need to read. If you do not volunteer, I shall volunteer you, be warned. Hannah, thank you very much. Uh, so please do unmute yourself and I'm going to ask you to read this Midrash for us in number 13. The men of the generation of the flood used to act thus. Each took two wives, one for procreation and the other for sexual gratification. 
The former would say like a widow would stay like a widow throughout her life while the latter was given a drink, a potion of roots so that she would not bear. And then she sat before him made up as a harlot. Thank you. And this say the rabbis, this is a sin that destroyed the world. The keeping of two wives, one for procreation, the other for sexual gratification. Moving from Midrash, which are the stories the rabbis told about the Bible, to rabbinic legend, which are the stories the rabbis told about themselves, we find another very interesting story in the Talmud. If you would continue, Hannah, please, the second source in 13. After the marriage, Rabbi Sun departed and spent 12 years at the academy. By the time he returned, his wife had lost the power of procreation. What shall we do, said Rabbi? Should we order him to divorce her? It would be said, this poor soul waited in vain. Were he to marry another woman, it would be said, the latter is his wife and the other his mistress. He prayed for mercy to be vouchsafed to her? Vouchsafed. Vou oh, vouchsafed to her, and she recovered. Thank you. So Rebbe refuses to allow his son to take a second wife for fear that that would demote the first wife from her position as Madonna to, her, to a position of whore, and that would be entirely unfair to her. We also have the following interesting interpretation, and this one's a bit more modern. Does anyone remember at what point in Genesis Jacob decides he's had enough of Haran and it's time to go home? Does anyone remember exactly what happened before that to make Jacob make this decision? If you do, please put the answer in the chat box. Only one? I'll tell you, it's right after Rachel has her first son, Joseph. And one of the interpretations is that Jacob did not want to go home to Israel while one of his wives was still childless because he was very embarrassed to present his father Isaac with two women, two wives, one of whom was very beautiful and had no children and one of whom was quite plain and had many children for fear that his father might think that he too committed the sin of the Madonna Hall paradigm. So we see here that the rabbis strongly disapprove of the Madonna Hall paradigm in practice. In theory, however, the Madonna Hall paradigm is still alive and well in Jewish literature. Uh, and there are many, many examples of this, but I'm gonna give you a select few. Um, both biblical and rabbinic literature are full of texts that establish a firm distinction between the modesty and demureness of a good woman and the brazenness and abandon of her fallen sister. And nowhere perhaps is this more iconic than in the book of Proverbs and the distinction between Eshet Chayl, the woman of valor, and the crafty harlot who is described just a few chapters earlier. And Hannah, if you're not yet sick of reading yet, can I um, ask you to please read the first two sources in number 14? Sure. A woman of valor who can find, for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband, the heart of her husband trusts in her, and he shall have no lack of gain. She doeth him good and not evil all the days of her life. She brings her bread from afar. She rises while it is yet night and gives food to her household. So that's the good woman, and then the bad woman. The lips of an immoral woman drip with honey and her words are as smooth as olive oil, but in the end, she is as bitter as wormwood and as sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lead to hell. Guard you from an evil woman, from the smooth tongue of a woman who is not your wife. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her captivate you with her eyes. Thank you. So this is still somewhat descriptive. But there are places in rabbinic law, prescriptive, that use this same distinction. And Hannah, I'm going to ask you to read the last source, and this is Talmud. This is the last source in 14. Rabbi Yehuda said, a sexually underdeveloped woman is the harlot stated in the Torah. Rav Huna said, what is um, Rabbi Yehuda's reason? Any intercourse that does not have the possibility of childbirth is harlotry. 
Thank you. So I'm not going to go too deeply into this because there's a lot to unpack here, but basically there's an idea that a priest cannot marry a harlot in the Bible. And the rabbis are trying to decide what a harlot means. And one of the interpretations is it's any woman who cannot give birth. And so here you have the Madonna Hall paradigm directly at work. If a woman cannot be a Madonna, i.e. a mother, she is necessarily a whore or a harlot. I will say parenthetically that that doesn't mean that the rabbi, for the rabbis, every sexual act has to lead to childbirth. That is not at all the case. In fact, we will see that it is not the case in the story we're about to learn together. But if a woman cannot have children ever, at least for this one rabbinic opinion, this takes her out of the Madonna camp and places her squarely within the camp of the whore. So although they officially reject the Madonna whore paradigm, the rabbis cannot seem able to rid themselves of the notion that there are, in fact, two opposite types of women. And Hannah, if you do one more piece of reading for us, please, and then we will um, relieve you of your duties. And this is number two. Number two. Oh, since the beginning, we find two opposite feminine stereotypes. The positive, loyal, moral woman who is beloved, wise, and charged with the preservation of the family unit and cultural continuity. And by contrast, the sensual, attractive woman who is independent, lascivious, enticing, self-indulgent, and loyal primarily to herself. Thank you. And it's this tacit acceptance of the Madonna Hall paradigm that makes our following story all the more remarkable. Uh, Dove. Is it your question about Hannah and the co-wife, Dove? Yes, okay, so I, I was just about to say that I realize that there are a few questions in the chat box that I'm ignoring. I really would like to try and make it to the end and not keep you guys too late, but I do promise to stay after hours and engage all of the questions you care to ask as long as I will wait. You allow no me. problem. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, let us now look at our main text, and that is the tragedy of Cheruta. The story is in the Babylonian Talmud, tractate Kiddushin, page 81b. What we're going to do, what I generally like to do with the stories of the Talmud, because they're usually quite short, is we will read the entire story through beginning to end get a sense of what it's about, understand just how much we don't understand because this story is incredibly rich and complex. And then we'll go back to the beginning and we'll try and unpack it bit by bit. So can I have another reader, please? Let's give poor Hannah a bit of a break. I'll read. Thank you, Barbara. So if you can take it from number one from the top and I might occasionally interrupt you. You have to unmute yourself though, Barbara. It was Rav Hayad ben Ashi's custom whenever he prostrated himself to say, may the merciful one save me from this evil inclination. Thank you. So I'm just gonna stop you there with some words of explanation. It was Rav Hayad ben Ashi's custom whenever he prostrated himself. Now this is a custom, uh, you might see people today in synagogue sort of doing this at certain points in prayer. In rabbinic times, they would actually get down on the floor. And at that part of the prayer, they'd lay the siddur to one side and they would confess what is in their innermost heart of hearts. They would freestyle. For Rav Chia, what is in his innermost heart of hearts is may the merciful one, i.e. God, save me from the evil inclination, Yetzer Hara. Now in the Babylonian Talmud, the evil inclination is the standard name for the sexual urge. Not, I hasten to add, because the rabbis believed that se the sexual urge was evil. Far, far from it. In fact, at one point they will say, why did it say on every day of creation it was good and on the sixth day it was very good? They say it was very good, that is the evil inclination. So the rabbis call the sexual urge the evil inclination, but they also recognize that there's a tremendous amount of good to this evil inclination. It's a very interesting paradox we're not going to unpack right now. Uh, continue, please, Barbara. One day his wife heard him. She said, for many years he has separated himself from me. Why does he say this? One day he was studying in his garden. His wife made herself up and passed before him repeatedly. 
He said to her, who are you? She said, I am Geruta, and I just returned today. Thank you. So another word of explanation, Geruta, the great um, Talmudic commentator Rashi tells us, and everybody accepts this, was the name of a famous local courtesan or prostitute. Continue, please, Barbara. He demanded her services. She said to him, bring me that pomegranate at the end of that branch. He jumped up, went, and brought it to her. When he came home, his wife was firing the oven. He rose up and sat in it. She said to him, what is this? He said, thus and so happened. She said, it was me. He paid no attention to her until she gave him the signs. He said to her, nevertheless, my intention was to violate a prohibition. That righteous man fasted until he died of that death. Thank you. I know, right, Hannah? It's just a crazy story, and we're going to try and understand it bit by bit. But before we do, I have to point out to you that this is one of the more popular stories among scholars of rabbinic literature. A tremendous amount has been written about it. And so before we try and come up with an interpretation of our own, I want to begin by presenting to you the interpretations that have already been given to this story. And I want you to be the experts and tell me whether you think these interpretations work or not. The first interpretation belongs to, once again, the classical commentator Rashi, or at least certain ways in which Rashi was read. And it reads as follows. Barbara, don't mute yourself yet. You're not done. Um, if I could ask you to please read number 15. He has separated himself from me because of old age. Because of old age. According to certain readers who base themselves on this piece of commentary by Rashi, the story of Rav Chiyabar Ashi and his wife is a story of an elderly couple. They're past their sexual prime. They're no longer active in that sense. And the story essentially is about a reawakening of desire. What do you think of this reading? Do you buy it and why? And again, you can raise your hand or you can use the chat box. Any thoughts? Is this a story about an elderly couple? Not necessarily. <laughs> Why do you think so, Barbara? Well, because I think they're looking for excuses. You mean, who's looking for excuses? The, this comment, the, the people who read the story this way are trying to apologize for right. this behavior? Right. Good, good. It's certainly an apologist reading. Um, Hannah, you say, I did not get that from this reading, and I think you're right, and I want to ask you why. What in the story implies that this is not an elderly couple? Um, I, well, it, it, I don't know what implies that it wasn't an elderly couple, but my reading was that he, it, it's more about him seeing her differently gussied up. Good, good, very good. So we'll get to that. Yes, Linda, he climbs a tree. So this is not an octogenarian. Ed, do you want to add to that? Sorry, Dov, was that very ageist of me? I apologize. Um, you look, you, you do not look like an octogenarian, Dov. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, well, let me see where I saw something. When, when number seven, where he said he demanded her services. Well, that doesn't mean, yeah. I mean, that doesn't mean that they're not old, but I don't know. I, I, I think your instinct is correct, Ed, and I'm going to add to that what Rav Yaakov says, and the life has gone out of the relationship, but not necessarily because of old age. I think the strongest evidence is in the very first line of the story. May the merciful one save me from an evil inclination. This is not a man whose sexual urges have gone out of him. This is a man who has to fight daily against his clearly very active sexual urge. So we're going to put this interpretation to one side and move on to a second interpretation. Now, the second interpretation belongs to a group of scholars 
who hold fast by a very basic rule in the reading of rabbinic literature, and that is rabbinic stories must always be read in context. To fully understand a story in the Talmud, we have to zoom out and see what happens directly before. So let's zoom out and see what happens directly before our story. And Barbara, unless you're sick of reading yet, I'm going to ask you to read the two passages that appear directly before our story in number 16. Reb Meyer used to scoff at transgressors. One day Satan appeared to him in the guise of a woman on the opposite bank of the river. As there was no ferry, he seized the rope and proceeded across. When he had reached halfway along the rope, he, Satan, let him go saying, had they not proclaimed in heaven, take heed of Reb Meyer and his learning. I would have valued your life at two ma's. Rabbi, you, two ma's are uh, uh, tuppence, or um, to use your lingual tender, two cents. Okay. Let's continue. Rabbi Kiva used to scoff at transgressors. <clears throat> One day, Satan appeared to him as a woman on the top of a palm tree. Grasping the tree, he went climbing up. But when he reached halfway up the tree, he, Satan, let him go, saying, had they not proclaimed in heaven, take heed of Rebbe Kiva and his learning. I would have valued your life at two ma'as. Thank you. And so scholars read our story, which again happens directly after these two stories in number 16 and say, well, there's a lot that all of these stories have in common. And once again, by chat box, what does our story have in common with these two tales we just read in number 16? I can think of several similarities. I mean the tree. Good, there's an act of overcoming a physical barrier, whether climbing a tree or going across a river. What else? Uh, someone disguised as a beautiful woman. Good, a seduction by a beautiful woman in disguise. And they are interested. And <laughs> They, they being great rabbis are interested, very yeah. good. So we have a seduction of a great rabbi by an entity in disguise, and then they have to overcome a considerable physical barrier to reach that entity. But Based on this, Barbara? It's also interesting that the seduction does not take place through normal seduction of the woman being the instigator, the seduction is simply the appearance of a woman. Good, good, good. And th that's absolutely true. And that is a, uh, a, a recurring in rabbinic literature where it's simply enough for a woman to exist and to be there for a man to just find her irresistible. She doesn't really have to do anything. Um, so based on this, certain scholars say, our story is simply part of a pattern. It is the ensnaring and undoing of a great rabbi by a treacherous femme fatale, who in our case just happens to be that great rabbi's flesh and blood wife. Barbara, if you could read number 17, please. The devil takes the shape of Reb Chaya's Ben Ash, Ashi's wife, manipulating him into a situation from which there is no way out other than death. The narrative <coughs> demonstrates that man cannot free himself from the firm grip of the evil inclination. Ooh. Thank you. And I want to ask you, once again, do you buy this reading? Do you think our story is really just more of the stain? Is it really identical to these two sources in number 16? No. Why not? What are some one differences? Is, one is the devil and the other is the wife. Good, so small difference. One is a devil and the, actual is an, the other is a flesh and blood human woman. Um, any other differences? The similarity is that it appears from the readings that the man is, has no choice. Uh, good, so we'll talk about that, but let's talk about the male attitude. Um, the two men in number 16, what's their attitude towards sexual sin? They don't have a comment. 
about. They, they don't really, they don't really have a disposition. They seem to give in, and when confronted by their supposed reputation in heaven, they're sort of let go, but they probably have egg on their face, so they have to live with that. Yes, good, good. So that's an important distinction as well. They are let go. There is a narrow escape at the end of each of these seduction narratives, whereas in our story, there is no narrow escape. The seduction is in fact carried through. I don't know if you noticed, we might've missed it. It's very easy to miss, but we're gonna go and look at the story again. And you'll see that the act, the act of seduction is really carried to fruition. And Rabbi also, Chia, and he admit, Rabbi Chia admits, excuse me, he admits that he intended to sin. Good, good. <laughs> I, wanted, I, I wanted to violate the prohibition. Good, so good. We'll talk a lot about that line. Yeah. Very good, yes. Also, to go back to the disposition, Rav Meir and Rabbi Akiva scoff at transgression, whereas Rav Chia seems to spend every day trying to protect himself from transgression. And finally, the woman in our story, who again is a flesh and blood human woman, she's not just a secondary character like Satan, whose only job is to occasion the seduction. She is the heroine of our story. We experience the entire story through her point of view. We see what she sees, we hear what she hears, which makes her the main character, the heroine of the story. So our story is simply not one more of the same, and we're going to put it aside and move to a third reading. And uh, we haven't even started our own reading and we're running out of time. So another important rule of thumb in reading rabbinic literature is you must study it in context, not just of where it appears in the Talmud, but also in its historical context. And a very important piece of historical context for the Talmud is the Talmud is composed very much with the advent of Christianity first as a sect within Judaism and later as a breakaway, wildly successful religion outside of Judaism, which ultimately takes over the entire Roman empire. The rabbis feel threatened by this and they feel they have to stand their ground and differentiate themselves from the Christians. And so what you will find often a lot in the Talmud, if you know how to look, because it's often subtext, is these underlying attacks, these implicit attacks against Christian beliefs and practices. Now around this time where again the division, the boundary between Jew and Christian was not yet firm, abstinence, the Christian ideal of abstinence was hugely popular, so much so that certain Jews started adopting it as their own. And so scholars say this is a cautionary tale the rabbis give us against adopting the Christian ideal of abstinence. If you try like a Christian to abstain from sex with your sexually wedded wife, with your legally wedded wife, you will end, end up, up like Avchia. No, I'm just, I'm gonna go quickly in the interest of time. I'm gonna ask you to please help me with that. And I promise to continue the conversation after. Um, you will end up like Avchia sinning with a prostitute. Uh, and Barbara, if you could please read number 18 for us. Barbara, you're muted. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, co it's covered. There it is. The Syriac Christian idea of a war for freedom from the sexual impulse captivated members of the Babylonian Jewish community. The story is a negative portrayal of the ascetic ideal, or at least its presentation as irremediably at odds with the common Jewish ideal of family life. Thank you. Now, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go quickly, but I do want to ask, this is a really good reading. It's situated firmly within the historical context. It corresponds to other stories that we have in the Jewish tradition of a woman who is deprived of sexual relations, who then achieves them through the medium of disguise. You've already mentioned Tamal. We're going to revisit Tamal. There's a very similar story that that is how King David was conceived. But I want to ask you once again, most scholars follow this interpretation. Most scholars think that this is exactly what happens in our story. And I'm going to go back to our story so you have it before your eyes, because I want you to tell me one last time, do you buy this reading? This idea that Rafkhia is 
deliberately abstaining from his wife because he's been taken in by the Christian ideal of abstinence. Okay, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you all have thoughts and they're, they're all brilliant, but I am gonna go quickly in the interest of time. I'm gonna tell you what I think. Uh, and my problem with this reading, compelling though it may be, is the very basic conjugal obligation that stands at the heart of the Jewish marriage contract. At the heart of the Jewish co marriage contract are three obligations that a husband owes his wife. One is food, the other is clothing, the third is regular sexual relations. Now, Rav Chia is not your run-of-the-mill Babylonian Jew who happens to be taken in by Christianity. Rav Chia is a rabbi. He's a head of the yeshiva. Can it be that he simply elects to ignore this very basic biblical command? And even if he does, why does the wife not do anything about it? Her marriage contract is being violated. She could sue for and obtain a divorce, according to Jewish law. And what for me is perhaps the most problematic, if Avchia Seh decides that he's going to break biblical law and abstain from his wife, how is it that he falls so immediately at the very sight of the prostitute without so much as a hint of resistance? So here's where I want to propose to you my reading. Uh, and for my reading, I'm going to go to Zygmunt Freud. Now, you don't have to agree with everything Freud says. I certainly don't. But one of the invaluable cultural insights that Freud gave us is that if you see an archetype throughout history and across cultures, cultures that don't necessarily interact or affect one another, you can assume that the root of that archetype is not social, but psychological, that it derives from within the human psyche. Freud looks around him, just kind of the way we did at the beginning of this class, and he sees that every culture has a Madonna Hall pair. And so he goes exploring its psychological roots, and he translates the Madonna Hall paradigm into the Madonna Hall complex. The Madonna Hall complex for Freud is a complex that affects men, and it's interesting to think about whether it affects women, and some people say that it does, but Freud speaks about men, so we're going to stick to men. Men who, as they mature, fail to develop a healthy, affirmative attitude towards sex. Such men, says Freud, are in danger of developing the following complex. And at this point, I'm going to ask for another reader, please. Let's give Barbara a break. Can anybody else read for us? Ed, thank you very much. So Bravo, I'm going to ask you to mute yourself and Ed, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, I apologize for some of the risque Freudian language, but we're gonna read number 21. <clears throat> the whole sphere of love remains divided in the two directions personified in art as sacred and profane or, in, or animal and parental love. <clears throat> when they love, they do not desire, and where they desire, they cannot love. <clears throat> if someone makes an impression that might lead to a high physical estimation of her, this impression does not find an issue in any sensual ex excitation, but in affection, which has no er erotic effect. This physic, physical, psychical, psychical impot uh, impotence manifests itself in a refusal by the executive organs of sexuality to carry out the sexual act. Although before and after they may show themselves to be intact and capable of performing the act. Thank and you. So I'm going to stop you there. Says Freud, the Madonna Hall complex is a psychical split between women who are objects of love and women who are objects of desire. Where they love, they do not desire, and where they desire, they cannot love. If a man suffering from the Madonna Hall complex comes to love and respect a particular woman, she will inevitably remind him of his mother, 
because with Freud it all goes back to the mother, he will then not be able to regard her erotically, he will not be able to desire her, and ultimately he will not be able to perform with her sexually. It is a form of psychical or psychological impotence. What do men do when they suffer from this complex? Again, according to Freud, these men will find an outlet in what he calls a debased sexual object. And Ed, if you can continue, please. Man is assured of complete sexual pleasure only when he can devote himself unreservedly to obtaining satisfaction, which with his well-brought-up wife, for instance, he does not dare to do. This is the source of his need for a debased sexual object, a woman who is ethically inferior to whom he need attribute no aesthetic scruples, who does not know him in his other social relations and cannot judge him in them. It is to such a woman that he prefers to devote his sexual potency, even when the whole of his affection belongs to a woman of higher kind. Thank you. And so for Freud, this is the root of the Madonna Hall paradigm of the division of women into loved but undesired Madonnas and into desired but unloved whores. Now, based on this psychological insight, I want to claim the following. It is not, as most critics claim, an aversion to sexual relations in general, the plagues are clear. It is an aversion specifically to sexual relations with his wife the Madonna. And with that, let's go back to our story and we will try very quickly to do a second reading, a close reading of it. And I'm going to apologize already now if I go a little bit over time in the interest of getting to the truth at the heart of this story. So our story, like many stories in the Talmud, is a three act drama. Act one in lines one and two, which I'm going to call Revelation. Act two in lines three to nine, which I'm going to call seduction, and act three in lines 10 to 17, which I'm going to call confrontation. Now, act one begins, like many stories in the Talmud, with a routine about to be broken. It's not rare for a Talmudic story to say, this is what happened every day, and one day something else happened. Now, the routine, as we have established, is a routine of marital abstinence. For many years, Avchia has abstained from relations with his wife. Now, I'm going to claim, in contrast to most other scholars, that this is not a deliberate decision. If Avchia Barashi does indeed suffer from the Madonna Hall complex, from this psychical split, then his wife, an object of sacred love, would be far beyond the realm of the sexual, divested of all erotic desire. His sexual drive may remain potent and dangerously so, but his wife can no longer arouse it. By this reading, it's not that Rav Chia refuses to perform his marital duties, he simply can't. And so the prayer that we find him desperately praying, may the merciful one save me from the evil inclination, is not, again, as most scholars claim, against the lust for his own wife. Quite the contrary, his wife, saintly and pure and safely asexual, poses no threat whatsoever. It's against those women beneath her, those low, licentious women who might burst the dam of his raging desire, which we know is exactly what happened. Now, what about the wife? How does she regard her husband's many year abstinence? Judging by her response to Rav Chia's revelation, for many years he has separated himself from me, why does he say this? It seems that the wife has believed that her husband is some sort of holy man who is far beyond the throes of carnal passion. A man who is fought, has fought his sexual urges and won. As such, the, the wife might have agreed to waive her right to sexual relations, and women can do that. It is their right to waive it, yielding to what she believes to be Rav Chia's wishes. And I want to say that here lies the full tragedy of the Barashi's marriage. You have a husband and wife 
each contending with unfulfilled sexual desire and each believing themselves to be alone in the struggle. What makes their situation all the more pitiable is their apparent inability to talk about it. Throughout this entire first act, and admittedly it is short, but throughout this entire first act, Ravchia and his wife engage in no dialogue whatsoever. Ravchia prefers to confess his yearnings in prayer, afraid that if he made such an admission to his chaste Madonna-like wife, she might despise him. And the wife, for her part, cannot bring herself to tell her holy man of her husband of her desire for fear of incurring his contempt. So it's not just sexual relations that Avchia and his wife abstain from, it is all relations. Until this routine is one day broken. Overhearing Avchia's desperate plea, the wife realizes how far the gulf, how wide the gulf between them has become how her husband is no more a holy man than she is a Madonna, how her own deepest desire is mirrored by him. What does she not do at this point? What would we expect her to do? Anyone by chat box quickly. What would be the normal response to this? Anyone? Talk, thank you, Linda, talk to him. Bring it up one night over supper. And yet she doesn't. Partly, I think, because if she did, there'd be no story for us to tell. But more to the point, I think the wife intuits that her husband is so deeply suffering from the Madonna Hall complex that talking to him at this point would be completely futile. Her husband will not touch her as long as she remains the Madonna in his eyes. And to bring down the barrier between them, she must become a whore instead. Act two, seduction. Again, I'm going at breakneck speed. Please um, forgive me and I'm happy to stick around and chat at the end. Um, act two begins with a second more radical break in the routine. One day, Rafia was studying in his garden. Now the important thing to know is that in Talmudic times, gardens were um, not the backyard. They were enclosed spaces that were often at some distance from the home. And the choice of a garden as a place of study is highly irregular. The only other times in the Talmud rabbi study in gardens is when they actually discuss the flora and fauna. Why then are we in a garden? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm sure you could get this, but I'm going to propose that um, the lush surroundings and ultimately the feminine seduction and the plucking of the fruit. Does this remind you of anything? Eden, thank you very much. This is an ominous connotation to the story of the Garden of Eden. Ravchia's controlled celibate world is about to descend into sin. And just as the setting changes, as we have moved the action from the order and civility of the home into the garden with all of its wildness and its disorder, so is our heroine transformed. His wife made herself up and passed before him. From a dutiful, demure housewife, the, our heroine becomes a promiscuous, brazen whore. She makes herself up. Remember how the women from the generation of the flood were made up as a harlot? In general, making yourself up in the Talmud is symbolic of women preparing for sex. Seeking in her painted disguise to lure her husband into releasing his pent up sexual energy and at the same time satisfy her own desires. This is not, again, as many scholars claim a fidelity test seeing whether Ravchia will succumb to the charms of another woman. I say this for many reasons, not least of which the fact that when he will finally confess to her, she seems entirely unruffled by it. This is a genuine attempt to recover lost intimacy with her husband. And so the minute Ravchia sees this ethically inferior woman, to use Freud's expression, he demands her identity. Who are you? Notice he fails to recognize her. 
which I think attests to just how alienated this husband and wife are. The wife responds, assuming the name Cheruta. We don't know her real name, Linda, and that is significant. Again, a famous local courtesan. Now, another important rule of thumb is that in Talmudic storytelling, every single word counts. What would have happened if the story would have read like this? Um, line number four, his wife made herself up and passed before him repeatedly. Line number seven, he demanded her services. It would have been basically the same story. This two line dialogue in lines five and six seems to slow things down. It seems to be superfluous. Dove, I'm gonna ask you to mute yourself, please. And yet I'm going to claim that these two, this two line dialogue is the critical turning point of the entire narrative for three reasons. One, it is the first instance of dialogue in the story. The yearnings that have been so carefully concealed until now are openly announced. Oscar Wilde famously said, give a man a mask and he'll tell you the truth. And this is exactly what is happening here as the wife who is hiding behind the mask of a prostitute flagrantly asserts her sexuality. Whereas Rav Chia, who is faced again to quote Freud with a woman who does not know him in his other social relations and cannot judge him in them, freely, solicits her services. Sorry, I realize I'm going really quickly. Happy to stick around and talk a lot about anything that it makes no sense later. Um, two, the wife's declaration, I am Cheruta and I just returned today, signifies far more than her promiscuous dress or her provocative manner, a complete change of identity. The former Madonna has now returned, changed, developed an identity unhinged from that of her husband. From a nameless, selfless wife of, she has now become an autonomous, full-fledged subject. Naming, we know, is an act of mastery. We see this a lot in the Bible. You name something, you gain authority over it. And so the wife in naming herself exhibits the agency and self-determination which she has acquired in her new role of whore. But third and most significant is the meaning of the name the wife chooses. Cheruta exists nowhere else in rabbinic literature as a name. It's a very strange name to be chosen. And scholars don't quite know how to explain it. Many of them, as Linda writes, go to the Hebrew word cherut, which is very similar to cheruta, meaning freedom. But the word has also been interpreted to mean um, reveler, wedding party, a withered branch, and a released prisoner. But the most interesting interpretation belongs to the Talmudic scholar Shlomo Ne'eh, who we read earlier and we will read again. Shlomo Ne'eh, because he can't find the word anywhere else in the Talmud, goes to look for it in contemporaneous, contemporaneous Syriac sources. In other words, in texts from roughly the same historical period and geographical region. And when he looks at those texts, he finds that there's cheruta all over the place. And so he collects all of the mentions and he analyzes them and he comes to the following remarkable conclusion. Um, and Ed, I'm going to ask you to please read number Twenty-four for us. <clears throat> the word is remarkable for its uh, genus-like duality of meaning. On the one hand, it reflects a life of self-control and suppression of impulse, the celibacy and dignity that are the obligation of the social class of free persons. On the other hand, it expresses the enticement of the sort of freedom that entails unrestrained behavior, debauchery, and less, less licentiousness. Less. Thank you. Uh, and Pam, I got the message. I will wrap everything up in the next eight minutes or die trying. Um, says Shlomo Noe, Cheruta is a pun. It plays on the double meaning of liberty as freedom to and freedom from. And so for choose, by choosing for herself this name, 
the wife essentially proclaims her ability to exercise both sexual freedom on the one hand as a wanton harlot and freedom from sexuality on the other hand as a freeborn noblewoman. So the very word charuta collapses these two categories of Madonna and whore. And as such, it is symbolic of the story as a whole. But all these subtleties are completely lost upon Afria. He is unable to contain his evil inclination any longer. He lays aside the Torah he's just been studying and he demands the prostitute's services. I will just say that the word that is used here is tva'a, meaning not just to solicit sex, but to solicit sex of a particularly coarse or animalistic kind, which is exactly consistent with what Freud tells us about the behavior of people suffering from the Madonna Hall complex. When they find a debased sexual object, they don't feel the need to have any kind of sexual etiquette with her. The sex is often quite rough and animal-like. However, at this point, our heroine is no longer an obedient housewife. And before she yields to her husband's services, she demands that he bring her a pomegranate from the uppermost bough of the tree. Because if her plan is going to succeed, she has to be able to prove her identity to her husband after the, de the deed is done. Ravchia, his desire of flame, scrambles up the tree, plucks the uh, fruit for her, and the narrator modestly draws the curtain on the scene. And we can only infer that the seduction has succeeded. Very, very quickly, act three, confrontation. With the opening of act three and the curtain once again rising, we are once again back in the order and civility of the house. And our heroine accordingly has slipped back into her role of dutiful housewife. As the curtain rises, we find her lighting up the fire, making dinner, engaged in the most wifely of chores. She has gone from Madonna to whore to Madonna, from kindling her husband's lust to kindling the kitchen fire with complete effortlessness. She is both sensual and dignified, amorous and demure, proper and passionate, all of these Madonna whore binaries seem to completely dissolve in her person. If anything, it is Ravchia who doesn't seem to be able to integrate decorum and desire. The events of the past few hours that have left his wife completely unfazed have traumatized him to the point of suicide. He comes home, sees his pure Madonna-like wife standing by the oven, is overcome with guilt and shame and throws himself into it. And let there be no mistake, throwing yourself into the oven in the Talmud is an act of attempted suicide. Now, perhaps from the sense of shock and perhaps from the newfound courage that she has acquired in her new role of whore, the wife breaks her many years of silence and turns to her husband in question, what is this? and the barrier of communication is shattered. As opposed to the double monologues of act one and the masked dialogue in act two, Ravchia and his wife for the very first time now communicate directly. The wife asks, what is this? And the husband, unable to lie, tells her the truth, thus and so happened, afraid that now that she knows the truth about him, she will despise him forever. And yet, rather than pain or anger or derision, his confession is met with one of her own. It was me. The prostitute in the garden, the debased sexual object, was me. And yet Ravchia refuses to believe her. He's clinging so tightly to his concept of his wife as pure Madonna, he cannot bring himself to see her in such a promiscuous light but the wife was completely prepared for this disbelief and she immediately produces the signs, which is probably the pomegranate that she has required, had required as pay. If she can only get him to see her as she is, a good woman and a sexual woman, an object of love and of desire, perhaps she could extricate him from the throes 
of the Madonna Hall complex. But to no avail, my intention was to violate a prohibition, Lovchia says stonily, and turns away from her, perhaps in guilt, perhaps in contempt. What should have come as huge relief to Lovchia, the knowledge that his grave sin wasn't that grave after all, devastates him even further. Whether he cannot forgive himself for succumbing to his evil inclination, or he cannot forgive his wife for failing to be the saint he had idolized, or both is unclear. But what is clear, and tragically so, is that the wife's plan has miscarried. Lovchia's Madonna Hall complex is still firmly anchored in his mind, and within it he must remain, she must remain, either a deified and untouched Madonna, or a despised and untouched whore or a widow, because unable to live with his burning sense of shame, Ravchia fasts until he dies of that death. Um, I want to talk about why the text calls him a that righteous man, but I can't in the interest of time. I'm going to say my final words, and then if time will give me any more time, I'm happy to stick around and answer questions, but I want to kind of bring this to a close. Up to now, we have seen how, by telling us the consequences of the, the devastating consequences of the Madonna Hall, complex, by giving us a heroine who is both Madonna and whore, and by giving us a name that means both Madonna and whore, our story systematically deconstructs the Madonna whore paradigm. I want to add one final level to this, and that is how the story, in its very structure, enacts the disintegration of the Madonna whore paradigm. So we said the story has three acts. Act one, featuring the Madonna in the home. Act two, giving us the whore in the garden. And act three, effectively fusing the two. Because although we're once again back in the home, the decorous home, and our, our heroine is once again an obedient housewife, there are still a number of whorish elements that punctuate the scene. The oven, both menacing and mundane, and as such a befitting symbol of female sexuality. The wife's assertiveness in saying, what is this? Her avowal, it was me, Anna Havai, which is a direct echo of I am Cheruta, Anna Cheruta in Act Two, and the pomegranate, which is a double symbol, both of fertility and lust. All these blur the boundaries between home and garden, decorum and desire, propriety and passion. The story itself, like its heroine, enacts the disintegration of the feminine dichotomy and Madonna and Hall become one. Why do the rabbis tell us this story? And with this, I do promise to end. First of all, I think it's remarkable that in the ancient world, which as we saw was so steeped with this binary view of women as Madonna or whore, the rabbis are able to re raise their head and say, you know what? No, that does not work. Women are not just one or the other. But it's my general argument that when the rabbis tell us a story of a woman, nine times out of 10, they're telling us a story of an other with a capital O. And through these stories, they teach us moral messages about how to treat the other in our midst. And this reduction of another person to a function, to a single stereotype, to a particular role that you fill for me, that, say the rabbis, is not just wrong, because no person is that one dimensional, and no man was put on this earth simply to say it, serve you. It is immoral. It is dangerous. It will end in death. And so what we have here is the rabbi's argument centuries before it was made by Immanuel Kant, arguably the most important Western philosopher, that we must never treat other human beings as a means to an end, but always as an end to themselves. We must see the others as we ourselves wish to be seen in all of their beauty, in all of their fullness, as the thou that they are. Only then can there really properly be a relationship. Only then can we really have an encounter. 
Thank you for bearing with me. Sorry for going so over time. Happy to stick around and talk about a lot more as long as Pam will let me. And uh, for those of you who have to leave, I will wish you a very lovely rest of the day. And um, yeah. Okay, lovely. Well, thank you so much um, for uh, teaching us today. And yes, we have the opportunity for maybe just a couple questions. We are over time. Um, does anyone have a question? You can unmute yourself or raise your hand. Hannah. Um, I'm curious if the if the wife transgressed from her own point of view. Like it Yeah. Um, does the wife transgress from her own point of view? Um, I don't think she transgresses, but I think her plan miss backfires. Uh, so I once taught this yeah. class in in a, an uh, and there was a, a a very knowledgeable psychiatrist in the audience, and he said to me later, the reason the plan didn't work is that it's shock therapy, and we know we can't practice shock therapy. If somebody doesn't want to see a certain reality, we can't violently force them to see it because there's a reason they're repressing it. Clearly, their psyche can't deal with it, and so by her quite violently trying to confront Rav Khia with her double reality, it shocked Rav Khia too much, and that does drive him to suicide. Uh, I'm not sure back in the ancient world that she had the option of saying to him, why don't you seek counseling, which would have been <laughs> the better way to go about it. Anyone else have a question real quickly? Yes, Rabbi Lerner. Uh, I'm so sorry that I sorry, was. Rabbi Lana, I, I, I called okay. you Dove. I apologize for that. No, 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 no. Excuse me. We are friends. The name is Dove. And let's go further. Um, one of the things is you're you're not only an excellent wordsmith, but you set up all of these niceties in in opposition or parallel. Uh, is it possible that this is related to being an ungrounding? for sexual dress up and games that we've that is now very much part of a lot of sexual work and on top of it it seems to be bo boober you can't treat the other as an object treat them as a vow so um if you uh when you write to me and, and i'll send you my source sheet thank you thank you uh boober is one of the sources we didn't read but that's exactly what i like uh, to okay. end with so Volkshakivanta. Not that I'm a dad, Gdolim. Um, the, the, the question of dress up is very, very, very interesting. I think we find some ambivalence toward it in rabbinic literature. Yes, uh, yes. On the one hand, um, a woman is not meant to, it's considered unseemly for a woman to kind of come out and say, I want sex. So the way women did that in the ancient world was to dress up. And that would like indicate to their husbands that they were in the mood and ready and willing. On the other hand, there's a very strong prohibition in rabbinic literature of having sex with somebody while thinking about somebody else. So, oh wow, yeah. So 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 dress up, yeah, yes, yeah. but but um, what's the word? Um, um, there's a word for it. Uh, the play acting that sometimes goes into the sexual. Play. Yeah, the masquerade, that would have been very, I think, problematic. Thank you. Well, with that, I will pass it over to Alex to conclude. And um, thank you, everyone, for your time. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Pam. Um, I just want to thank Gila so much for joining us today and leading us in that very interesting lesson. I want to thank our partner, BMHBJ and Rabbi Jatovsky. Um, and of course, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Just want to let you know that we have another opportunity to learn together tomorrow um, at 1 p.m. Pacific with Rabbi Dr. Jeremy Rosen um, for our program, King David, Man of War and Politics, Man of God, Man of Contradictions. So I hope you can join us for that as well. And thank you again for learning with us today. Have a great day.